been a really interesting week. Interesting both in good ways and in bad ways. I don't know if any of you have been following some of the news that has been happening. I think a lot of us have been aware of the conflict between Israel and Palestine and um, some of the, the tragic and hopeful things that have been happening there. And I remember at the beginning of the week just seeing these videos and pictures that were just so beautiful of families being reunited, of um, loved ones being freed from prison. And then of course, as the week has progressed, as the temporary ceasefire has ended, then we're back again to news of shelling and bombing and destruction. And, and it's the, these two kind of, um, this cycle it feels like of, of just loss and violence that we keep going through again and again. And so these emotions that we've had this week, joy and hope and waiting and expectation, and then also mourning and desperation. And it's strange, but I think that in many ways, this mix of emotions is exactly what we should feel as people who are trying to follow Jesus. We see the tension and the hardships and the hurt and the grief around us and in this world and in us. We know of these struggles. We don't, um, we don't mask them, but at the same time, we also acknowledge that God is still present with us, and there is joy, and there is hope in that. Fleming Rutledge writes that this is precisely the Advent situation. Doom on one hand, deliverance on the other. So even as lights are strung, as decorations are put up, as shops start to blast cheery and cheesy music, we can't ignore that God's purpose for the world is not yet realized. We can't ignore that there is hardship. We can't disguise how difficult this time of year is for so many people, especially people who are missing loved ones. And as the happiness we feel we should have it can also ring false in our reality. But today, as we celebrate the first Sunday of Advent, as we light that candle for hope, as we watch it burn bright, we're invited also to hold on to a vision of renewal and transformation that's firm and that's concrete, and that won't fade and die away like so many pine needles on our floor. In Advent, we're actually preparing for God's invasion into our messed up world. We're proclaiming the good news that one day, things will be put to right, that families can be reunited, that peace will reign, that death and mourning will be no more. And what, it is, what a gift it is to us and to the church to have this season that so perfectly matches our human condition, where we don't have to fake it where we can acknowledge our pain and our longing and at the same time have hope. A couple of weeks ago, I was at the national conference hosted by the Canadian Alliance to End Homelessness. As you can probably imagine, that was a pretty intense conference. And, uh, and yet there was also a lot of hope there. In one of the sessions, one of the presenters, Ian DeJong, he's worked um, with a lot of different shelters all across the nation. And he started his presentation with discussing some of the struggles that we have in addressing homelessness. He lists them here. He says, scarcity of housing that's affordable, insufficient income assistant rates, a pandemic, increased encampments, overflowing shelters, data reporting just demands and more demands, insufficient funding, broken systems, increased drug poisoning, inequities, staffing shortages, increased needs of people experiencing homelessness, politicians and politics. It is all so overwhelming, he said. But the interesting thing was that in this presentation, after encouraging the whole audience to say a certain four-letter word I won't mention here, Ian went on to talk about what keeps him going in the face of these overwhelming situations. And what I thought was particularly inspiring is that his language was very similar 
to what we might find in the church. He spoke about having a higher purpose, a higher why. He talked about knowing who you serve. He talked about hope, and he laid out a set of beliefs that are based on that hope. He said things like, I believe recovery is possible. I believe that people, if they have a place, somewhere to live, something to do, and someone to love, are better off. And these kinds of things, these hope, are messages that ring true in that setting, but that I think ring true in our Christian context as well. In Mark 13, 24 to 27, Jesus says, But in those days, after that suffering, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light, and the stars will be falling from heaven, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. Then he will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. While Ian's hope lies in his belief for change, Jesus in this passage is describing much more than just the power of positive thinking or of how we might muster the needed programs and government policies to end homelessness. Jesus is talking about an ap apocalyptic inbreaking, a whole cosmic shift. He's talking about something much bigger than we can even imagine. When we think of Advent, our minds go to Christmas, to a little baby in a manger, maybe to greenery and Advent calendars and presents and food and all the things we have to get done. Or maybe our thoughts drift off to the people we miss, the conflicts and tension, all the things we've prayed about and that God hasn't seemed to fix yet. But Advent is so much more than that. The hope that we're looking for surpasses our local context, surpasses the short-term fixes, the temporary shelters, short-term truces. We anticipate and remember Jesus being born to a poor family in the Middle East because that event reminds us that God can and does break into our world, and it gives us the assurance that he will do it again. In fact, every time we gather together and hear God's word, every time we come and celebrate communion, we're declaring that God comes into our lives, he comes to be present with us here, now. Tish Harrison Warren, in the Advent book we're doing in our Advent study, writes, The church gathers each week to read the scriptures together and celebrate the sacraments, not to satisfy our longings, but to make them more acute, more aching, more intense. Augustine says the point of gathered worship, the point of hearing and receiving the word of God, is to sow and germinate our longing for more to grow and expand it so that it creates a space within our souls that only God can fill. So if you're sitting here unsatisfied, if you're here and your heart is torn, if you're feeling that things in your life, in this world, are not as it should be, if you're grieved by your own loss or the loss around you, if you worry about those sleeping in the cold, if you're sleeping in the cold, if you feel the injustice of systems and governments that seem just too big to change, if there's disquiet and unrest within you, you might actually be feeling exactly what you should be. If you want to cry out with Isaiah 64, oh, that you would tear open the heavens and come down, this is exactly the right place and the right time for you. Fleming Rutledge writes, The Messiah came not to a purified and enlightened world spiritually prepared for his arrival, but rather to a humanity no nearer to its original goodness than on the day that Cain murdered his brother Abel. She adds that the human situation is so tragic that there's no answer for it within history. The Christ event is therefore the invasion of this world by another, who is retaking for himself the world he created. Christ in Advent, we are told, we believe, we are hoping, is retaking the world for himself, the world that he created. 
And so we can both lament our present situation and the present condition of our world and our humanity, as well as anticipate and hope and celebrate the inbreaking of God. But how do we do that? In our service, we say, Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. What do we do until he comes? What do we do as we long for change, as we long for the fulfilling of God's promises, as we sit here in the already and the not yet? Well, I'm glad that Gregory is here at the back because Jesus says that the main thing is to be like Gregory. The name Gregory comes from the Greek Gregoriat, meaning be wakeful. In Mark 13, 34, Jesus gives this parable to his waiting church. It is like a man going on a journey when he leaves home and puts his slaves in charge, each with his work, and commands the doorkeeper to be on the watch. Therefore, keep awake, for you do not know when the master of the house will come, in the evening, or at midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may find you asleep when he comes suddenly. When I say to you, I say to all, keep awake, keep Gregory. This parable and its warning to keep anticipating God's inbreaking, to keep actively, actively waiting, it actually reminds me from a scene from C.S. Lewis's The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. I don't know how many of you have read the book or seen the movie, but there's this scene where this little girl, Lucy, goes to visit the fawn, Tumnus. And she's actually been to his house before, she's met him before, and he invites her over for tea. So she comes into his little cozy den, and she has a nice cup of tea with Tumnus, and they have a, a good chat. And then after, after tea, she sits by the fireplace, and Tumnus begins to play his magical flute for her. And as Lucy is cozy by the warmth of the fireplace, even though she's heard of the white witch, the evil white witch, even though she knows that there's a spell in the land that she's around in Narnia, she nevertheless sits there content while Tumnus plays his flute until finally she's fast asleep. But this sleep, this shedding of the world's troubles, almost spells doom for Lucy. Because as she has slept, the white witch has been on her way to capture her. And Lucy risks missing both the arrival of St. Nicholas with his gifts and the arrival of Aslan, the lion, the Christ figure in the book. And Tumnus wakes Lucy up just in the, in the nick of time and gets her to run off and leave. So while we don't have Tumnus the fawn playing his magical flute to us, and while the days get darker and it gets colder, and while it's overwhelming on the outside, we may find it tempting to sit in comfort, to cozy ourselves up under a blanket or by the fire, to let the outside world, its darkness and troubles fade away. In this way, we can get lulled into inaction by the safety and relative comfort of our own environments. Even our hardships can get us to focus just on ourselves, to forget about being ready for God to show up. And so we're called by Jesus to wake up, to be wakeful. This doesn't mean that we never rest, rather that we're in a state of readiness. The kind of awareness that Jesus is talking about here is not a matter of passive waiting and sitting around. It's to try to be a light to the corner, every little corner of darkness. It's to try to capture the image that Terence gave us last week of millions of Christians each doing their little acts of grace, their little acts of love in anticipation of the coming of God's great redeeming work. We do this in increasing awareness that none of the grace or love that we can muster comes from ourselves but that the Holy Spirit of God gives us that patience and that love when we ask. To Harrison Warren says, I often forget how to wait on the Lord. I begin to believe that I'm the master and maker of my own life. I begin to believe that joy is self-made through my own ingenuity and hard work. I begin to believe that I'm the engineer of my own deliverance. And into these fevered deceptions, Advent comes each year 
and quietly asks me to pause, to remember that we do not bring the kingdom of God to the world through our own effort or our own timeline. We wait for one outside of us and outside of time. We wait for our coming king. Our hope then lies in the fact that our discontent, our longing, our dissatisfactions are not feelings to be wrapped and masked up and covered in tinsel. They're actually exactly what we should be feeling. But we also live with the promise that God will come to reclaim his creation, that there will be an inbreaking and a transformation that will set the whole cosmos to right. So be disturbed, be disquieted, be affected by the world's conflict and pain, be uncomfortable, be in longing, because in fully feeling our situation, we know that we've not become numb, and we make room for where we need God to show up.